Hey there, Game Master. Have you come seeking the grail of D&D wisdom? Sit, my child, and I will pour you a cup. In this short video, we're going to talk about group ability checks. Specifically, how you can avoid them becoming too mechanical and gamey, and how to keep the focus on the narrative. I'm GM Jim, and now let's dig into it. Here's what the 2014 Player's Handbook says. To make a group ability check, everyone in the group makes the ability check. If at least half the group succeeds, the whole group succeeds. Look, rolling dice is fun. Rolling dice as a group can be really fun, especially when failure could come at a high cost. But the problem here is that group ability checks are just too often too easy, too rote. And I've seen many GMs ignore this rule about half the group needing to succeed in many different circumstances. When it comes to checks like perception, investigation, survival, history, if anyone in the group succeeds, then the GM imparts that information to that one player, and then that player's PC tells all the other PCs. If you have four people rolling on a skill, at least one of them is going to hit the target number, right? So what's the point of rolling at all in that situation? You're probably rushing to the comments section right now to gm explain to me how only bad GMs do that, and you're probably right. But in general, group skill checks are just lacking something. It's sort of the same problem I have with spamming the help action and the guidance spell. It becomes gamey and mechanical and reduces the overall level of immersion. You can make group checks hardcore by saying that if anyone fails, then everyone fails. Or you can make a nat 1 count as two failures like Matt Mercer of Critical Role does. But this may be too punitive. Instead, I have some ideas about how you can refocus group ability checks on the narrative and spice up this bland dish. First is something of my own creation I call the high and low. This is using the standard rule of everyone rolls and if half succeed, then the group check succeeds. But we're really going to zoom in only on the highest roll and the lowest roll. Because the added twist here is that whoever rolls the highest has to roleplay how they prevent the person who rolled the lowest from messing it up for everyone. They have to explain how they help or cancel out the actions of that PC. They can RP it together if they want. So the rogue who rolled a 29 stealth has to explain how they're going to keep the fighter who rolled the 3 on the stealth check from blowing it for everyone. How do you keep that full plate armor from clanking? Do you spray it down with oil? Do you slap wheels on the fighter's boots and roll that person along like luggage at the airport? We're looking for a fun and creative answer here to bring the focus back on the story the dice are telling us to tell. The second is something I'm stealing from the Tales of the Yawning Portal, and this is combined ability totals. In the Sunless Citadel adventure, there's an encounter where it says, the lid can be removed with a successful DC 15 strength check or by the effort of any combination of characters whose combined strength is 30 or higher. I'm guessing this combined strength thing is from an older edition of D&D since Sunless Citadel is adapted from an older module. I did some research but couldn't find out conclusively. Feel free to point it out in the comments if you know this to be true. But what I like about this is that it uses the ability score and not the modifier, which in 5e, you hardly ever care about the actual ability score number once you're done with character creation. You'd think the designers would take advantage of this stat more often. Like, sometimes instead of hitting a DC, you could roll a d20 and have to roll under your ability score number. Other RPGs use this roll under mechanic. Anyway, I digress. So instead of having the whole group roll, for example, you could create challenges where you require an intelligence or wisdom score of say 35 or 40 to figure out a puzzle. So the players look at their sheets and they figure out that if the druid, the ranger, and the monk get together, they have enough combined wisdom between the three of them to meet this challenge. Then the GM asks them to roleplay how they came to this conclusion and what it looks like when they work together. And the third item on my list is nominating a champion. This is one way to combat spamming of guidance and the like. If your party has a bard and a cleric or druid, this is perfect for you. Instead of having the whole group roll, the group instead nominates one champion to roll on behalf of everyone. And so one PC can give that PC the help action, plus they get guidance from the cleric and bardic inspiration from the bard to pump that number up. The GM can set the DC high, but with all the support coming from other members of the party, they should be able to knock it out of the park. And with everyone's hopes resting on that one nominated person, it should be a tense moment. Make sure you have the whole party roleplay it out, like how the help action person is helping, and what it looks like when the guidance spell is cast. 
And speaking of the help action, how do you do it at your group? Out of combat, do you allow anyone to give help, or do you require that that person be proficient in the skill, like how Matt Mercer does it? And if you have an alternate idea for how to make group skill checks more interesting, please let me know down in the comments. I look forward to reading them. Until next time, this is GM Jim. Now go out there and roll some dice together.